Good evening. I'm Joe Carbonetta, and from the Pasadena Media Center, this is Arroyo Live. Our program is produced by Pasadena Media to help enrich our community through informative and meaningful conversation. Remember, you can share your questions or comments with us anytime at Arroyo Live at PasadenaMedia.org. In January of this year, after almost 37 years with the Pasadena Police Department, longtime police chief John Perez officially retired from public service, prompting interim city manager Cynthia Kurtz to take the unusual step of appointing two interim police chiefs to fill the vacancy while the city searches for a permanent replacement. The first interim chief, formerly Assistant Chief Cheryl Moody, served in the position from January 6th of this year until May 2nd, after which she too announced her retirement following a distinguished 30-year career. Enter Jason Clausen. Formerly a commander with the Pasadena Police Department, he is the second, now current, interim police chief, having taken the position following the completion of Moody's term. Tonight, I talk with Interim Chief Clausen to learn about the current state of the city from a law enforcement standpoint, and hopefully gain some insight into what we can expect moving forward. Please join me for tonight's edition of Arroyo Live. Tonight, I'm joined by Pasadena Police Department Public Information Officer, Lieutenant Marcia Tagliaretti, and Interim Police Chief, Jason Clausen. Welcome, both of you, to the show tonight. Hello, Joe. I'd like to start out by asking simply about uh, your yourselves and your positions. I'm hoping that you might each, in turn, take a moment to tell our viewers at home a little bit about yourselves. Uh, Jason, as the interim police chief, can I start with you, please? Sure. Well, thank you for having me on, first of all. Uh, my name is Jason Clausen. Uh, I am a 30-year veteran here at the police department in the city of Pasadena. Uh, I was born in Chicago, Illinois, uh, moved to Albuquerque when I was about eight years old, graduated high school in Albuquerque. Uh, a week later, I joined the U.S. Uh, Navy, and I was stationed on board the USS Ogden that was stationed out of uh, Long Beach here in uh, California. Uh, I was a firefighter, and while in the Navy, I traveled the world twice and uh, uh, was involved in the Exxon Valdez oil spill cleanup efforts uh, back in uh, the late 80s. Uh, 1991, I became a member of the Pasadena Police Department, and I've been here ever since. I've uh, grown through the ranks at different, uh, uh, in different units, uh, playing different roles in the community, from being a frontline officer, working narcotics, undercover, uh, being a detective, small stint at uh, um, the uh, Rose Bowl, Rose Parade uh, scheduling, uh, also involved in, uh, uh, as a member of the uh, FBI's uh, Safe Streets Task Force, uh, going after transnational gangs that uh, touch Pasadena as well. Uh, became a supervisor in 2006, and then I was promoted to a lieutenant in uh, 2013. I served as a press information officer for the chief of police as the chief's adjutant. Uh, and I got promoted as a commander and I led the criminal investigations division. Uh, and now I'm the, uh, you know, honored yet humbled to be in the position as an interim chief. I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I begin this journey here and it's not a destination, it's actually a journey. Uh, I think our, our, our goals are, uh, they remain uh, contemporary. Uh, that we have to continue to reduce crime, maintain order, provide hope and calm fears. And I think how we do that is uh, through communication, uh, a little bit of common sense, some, uh, some logic and a concern for people. And I think that through collaborative partnerships with the community, we can be successful and move the department forward. Uh, may or may not be the, the chief uh, when the position is uh, chosen, uh, but if I'm not, uh, I want to set it up for the next uh, woman or man uh, that they're in a uh, in good hands to to move this department forward. The officers on the front line deserve it, and that the community deserve it as well. So thank you. So yours is a very storied career, and we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. 
Uh, Marcia, I'd like to turn it over to you and have you please tell our viewers at home a little bit about yourself and your All position. Right. Thank you. Chris. Thank you for having me. My name is Marcia Tagliaretti. I'm lieutenant here at the police department. And I started uh, my career in 1983 with Pasadena, city of Pasadena. And that was part-time as a police cadet. And then in 1986, I then was uh, moved to the police trainee position, became an officer. So my time on with the city is um, uh, going on 39 years. My law enforcement time is, this is my 36th year. And I've worked uh, various assignments, starting with the uh, patrol, I worked detectives, um, I worked our neighborhood crime task force, uh, moved on to our research and development section as a supervisor besides patrol. I worked in our uh, training unit, also a professional standards unit. Um, I also, before that, and uh, detectives had a little bit of uh, crime analysis. And then in 2018, I promoted to police lieutenant and worked patrol. And um, in fact, I left patrol, uh, been in this position, the PIO position since May 9th is when I started. I was in patrol prior for um, since uh, 2018, so about four, uh, four years. And I mainly supervised our uh, formerly, which was our Northwest service area <clears throat> in, uh, in Pasadena. Um, so I'm now the, um, the department's uh, PIO and I put in for the position, very pleased uh, to be here and looking forward to the challenge. Well, and thank you both for being here this afternoon. I know that you both have very, very busy schedules. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk with us and our viewers at home. Before we get in a little deeper to your positions and the work that you do, I, I would like to take the opportunity to ask, and uh, especially as you both have had uh, quite a bit of time with the Pasadena Police Department in various capacities over the years, what would you sum up the status of the city currently from a law enforcement standpoint? And uh, Jason, as the chief or interim chief, I'd like to, to begin with you. Yeah, I think that uh, there's, you know, strong societal expectations on law enforcement. Uh, you know, we have to operate on high standards every day. Uh, you know, pro be professional, uh, civility, uh, be fair, be impartial. And I think that uh, there's levels of transparency that, that needs to, to be shown too. And I think that these are expectations by anybody. Uh, but at some times or some point, you know, we, the police, have to confront people who are angry, under the influence, violent, mentally impaired, or may think that you know the, the police's authority don't you know relate to them. Uh, so we have to be in these situations and and you know provide our lawful influence. Uh, sometimes it's by mere presence. Sometimes it's uh, you know going hands on to take somebody into custody. And we need to be balanced. We we need to know that, uh, or people need to know that we the police are here. And I learned a long time ago. Uh, from a woman in the community who told me it was right after a shooting and, and God forbid nobody was hit uh, by this shooting, but she said that the police were there immediately, but all they did was drive by the scene. We drove by the scene looking for the suspect who was uh, uh, involved in this crime. And she says that was the wrong thing to do because we knew that we were safe when you, the police showed up, but we didn't feel safe. We wanted you guys out of your cars in the area with us, walking with us, talking to us. And she really, you know, gave me another understanding of what, you know, public expectation is, the community engagement, the value of our relationships. Uh, and I've learned over the years, I've always said that I'm a, a student of, of this profession, that we have community partners, we need to have community enrichment, we need to have engagement strategies. And I think that, you know, over the years, as a student of the, our profession, we need to learn how to do things better. And these are like fine little nuggets. And I have, and I've written a lot of stuff down. Uh, you know, I'm looking at community engagement strategies as we move again, I'm the interim chief. So I'm trying to move the department forward uh, uh, right now. And you know, if I become the chief, that's great. More, more strategies will come out. And there's a lot of stuff that we're doing right now uh, that we need to expand on. So I think that, you know, policing is a must. Uh, police need to be in our communities, building relationships, walking the streets, uh, engaging with business partners, uh, with the, the people in the parks, uh, and you know, develop these relationships. Uh, a lot of times people want access to the police department and a simple phone call or, or calling somebody back in, in a timely manner is, is sometimes all people are asking for. 
But, you know, as we move forward, we got to continue to build trust, uh, you know, look at our policies and change our policies if they're not working. Think about technology, our social media, you know, officers training, the education of officers and wellness on how the officers themselves are doing because uh, they're out in the community and they're, they're, they're dealing with trauma all day long on different levels, as well as community members who are suffering as being a victim or arrested or a family member is taken away or hospitalized. So that again, these are, those are big things to look at. And it's every single day uh, when I, I come into work, I know that something is going to happen today that, you know, my skill sets, uh, you know, I, I think that as the interim chief, I take a, a job interview every day. Anytime I'm talking to people, these are my, my talking points. These are my telling points. This is what I expect from, 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 from me. This is what I expect from the community and hold me accountable if, if need be. Uh, and I think that, you know, again, working together, uh, the value of relationships uh, will go a long way, just not in life, but, uh, you know, on the job and outside the job. And I think that there's a lot of people that are in the community today that, you know, value not just my friendship, but I'll listen, I'll stop and I'll listen. And uh, people will, will tell us certain things, how they don't like things. And we've gone and we've fixed it or we've changed the way we do, we do business. So I think that's one of my goals. And overridingly, as I end my, my little uh, speech here, is that I know that my job is to prepare the next man or woman for my job and for the jobs of supervis being, being supervisors in our organization. We have to get them the right tool set and the know-how, how to become great leaders, how to do in key, uh, community engagement, how to create community initiatives. And it's sim sometimes as simply as showing up at a scene, showing up at someone's house, uh, doing some prevention, intervention, and enforcement when needed. So I think that's a huge balance uh, that you know we have to navigate as police officers every day, letting the people know, hey, we're here and we're here to help you. Well, when we... Uh turn on the news at night, open a newspaper, uh, any place that you get uh, information from, it seems that uh, there is a wave of criminal activity that is taking over not only here in Southern California, but really across the nation. Um, certainly, we've seen some very, very, unfortunately, large crimes, the mass shootings, but uh, more locally, we've seen a lot of smash and grabs. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of, of home invasions. And, and of course, a lot of this taking place in, in L.A. County in general. But to bring it very local, is Pasadena experiencing any type of a crime problem right now? Are we seeing similar uh, escalations of violence within the city here in Pasadena? And, and I asked this question to both of you. Uh, Marcia, you mentioned that you were in enforcement just a, a few days ago before taking over as the public information officer. W what would you say is the current status of the city? Hmm. Question. Well, <clears throat> currently, is, um, I know May got busy or challenging for us as far as some of our um, uh, violent crimes as far as our, uh, the shootings that we had. But again, part of our prevention intervention enforcement is the violence reduction e effort that we put forth. And that is additional officers that we have out in the field when they're working prime areas where we've had uh, incidents of, uh, of these high crime. So that's definitely one thing that we've, we make sure that we keep going. You know, I think just to touch on that too, is that uh, there are two levels of concern that I have, uh, and it's with simple assaults that happen in our community and domestic violence. Simple assaults we can address uh, by, you know, uh, you know, being out and being uh, present at, dirt, at high crime areas, let's say. Uh, you know, we can walk footbeat where we know people have been fighting. You know, we can look at statistical data we know that people are loitering here. Sometimes people are drinking here. Next thing you know, uh, uh, you know, there's a, a fight that breaks down. And we can get out there and we can stop some of that. We can prevent it and we can intervene in that type of violence. The hardest violence to get involved in is domestic violence, where we can't show up at people's house at midnight. We can't knock on the door and just say, hey, is everything going on good here? Uh, and, and that's one of the concerns. Uh, and then we know that when domestic violence is reported, not everything is being reported. There's a lot more in our society that's going on that is never going to get reported. Uh, for instance, uh, we recently had uh, 
implemented the shot spotter technology, which is a gunshot detective system, detection system. Uh, it went live on February 9th. Since that time, we've probably gotten about, I would say between 35 and 40 alerts where uh, uh, gunfire was detected in our neighborhood. It's detected by artificial intelligence and then by somebody at the company listening to the data and then instantaneously sending it to the police uh, so we respond. Of all of those cases of the all the alerts, we've probably had at least 25 documented shootings where either somebody was hit by gunfire, a house was hit, a car was hit, uh, or there was projectiles or shell cases left at the, at the crime scene. But as we did our initial analysis of this data, we know that only 80% of these calls, or excuse me, only 20% of these calls were reported by, by a, a, a community member. So we know that 80% of the calls are not being reported. Uh, and when we do door knock or talk to people, the, they say that, oh, we heard gunfire, but we didn't know where it was coming from. So I decided not to call or, oh, somebody else will call. And, and so that was the thing that, you know, so before we had this detection system, uh, we, we, I'm sure we missed out a lot of incidents that we could have intervened or, you know, been on scene to help, uh, help save somebody's life who'd been shot. There was an instance where, uh, on Lake Avenue, there was uh, uh, the uh, one round was detected, like one gunshot was detected by the system, and the cops were there instantly. And when they got out of their car, there was three guys standing around, and there was a gun on the ground. And then when they got detained, there was, uh, another one of the subject was in possession of a firearm as well. So luckily, we got those guns out of the uh, off the streets. Uh, these three gentlemen are going to end up uh, paying, uh, you know, the the price for what what what's it ends up happening to them in the court systems. But, you know, we, we watch and we, we look at trends, uh, we look at, we mine data, we mine our own data. Again, uh, it, we're students of the profession, we need to do a better job. And if we can prevent and intervene, then we, we're not going to have to enforce that much. You know, I think that the, the community too, uh, you know, we have to develop initiatives uh, to, to improve quality, uh, quality of life and, uh, you know, increase uh, community dependency or less dependency on the police and solve uh, community problems. Well, you mentioned that since the shot spotter system has come online, you are now aware of 80% more uh, of these gun violence incidents than were being reported previously. But is this 80% increase uh, unexpected or something you always suspected? And are you concerned about it? Yeah, well, we, we've always known that, you know, Officers will hear will, will hear gunfire sometimes, but you know you're out in the street at midnight, and you know the the these the the gunfire is reverberating through the neighborhood. You can never sometimes know where this actually happened. So yeah, we know gunfire was uh, occurred. Nobody's calling. We check the local hospitals. Nobody's showing up with gunshot wounds. And maybe somebody might call a day or two later and say, "Hey, I have a, a bullet in my car or in my house." Uh, so I, I knew I knew that it would increase our response, but the technology is very good to where it basically pinpoints on a map where the the gunfire is uh, uh, being reported, and that was one of the things where we would have an incident. Six callers would call, and they would all tell us different things where they thought the gunfire occurred. So I think one of our first alerts, uh, we knew that one round was fired. And it was right here at the corner of this street. And sure enough, the cops went right where they were supposed to. And there was one shell casing on the ground. But no, there was no victims. There was no, nobody there to report it. Maybe somebody shot a gun in the air. Again, we don't know. So despite the seemingly dramatic increase in, in actual reportable numbers, you don't suspect there's been a significant increase in actual crime. It's just that you're now becoming aware of what's been going on within the city. Firing a gun in Pasadena is a crime alone. It doesn't need, you don't need a victim. And God forbid we have any victims. One shooting is one shooting too many in Pasadena. Uh, so, but I think, again, this system will help us pinpoint where things occur, but also get us to the scene, to maybe save somebody's life who's suffering that if we can't find them and two minutes go by, they may, uh, they may die versus us being able to render aid and or summon the paramedics to assist. Well, switching gears just slightly, uh, earlier in your responses, you mentioned twice that uh, you feel that as the interim police chief, uh, your ultimate priority is to get the, the position ready for whomever 
takes over. And you have mentioned uh, that if it is you, I believe was the phrase you used. So if I may ask, are you in the running? Are you, do you uh, desire to become the permanently installed uh, chief of police here in Pasadena? Well, they launched a, the, a national search at uh, the beginning of June. Uh, the application process closes, I believe, July 1st or July 3rd. Uh, I've thought about it. I'm ready to apply. Uh, I just need, you know, need to make that commitment to apply. And uh, when I when I do, uh, I will, you know, submit my paperwork. Uh, so I still have a couple of weeks left uh, to decide. Uh, but I think that I can I can do the job, and I have, uh, you know, uh, engagement strategies. Uh, I know that we can continue to carry on some of our community outreach. Uh, we do we're doing tons of uh, of different things now that we're getting out of the COVID era where we we went and we did a lot of police athletic league events with mentoring our kids our cal our pal kids uh online uh so now we're getting back into the community uh we're we're, we're doing uh uh our community police academy both english and spanish uh we're having a classic car show this uh this saturday coming up in centennial square out in front of city hall uh you know we've done a lot of different things with the kids over the years uh, the Junior Public Safety Academy, uh, Read Across America. Uh, we have explorers that are, are working uh, to learn about the police and to learn, uh, you know, leadership lessons and life lessons and how to become a better adult. We're doing uh, presentations at our schools, uh, building tours. Uh, you know, uh, we have information tables at city events now and. Uh, working with the Boys and Girls Club uh, to get our officers back onto the streets. But there's much more to do in this, uh, this realm as well. You know, there, there's more uh, uh, communication efforts that frontline officers need to have with the community, with the kids, uh, you know, listening to what, uh, what the community wants. You know, just because the police academy teaches you to go out and enforce the law, there's so many other things to teach uh, you know, the frontline new officers on how to engage the community, let the community know that we are there to help them. Uh, we're not there to hinder them. You know, a lot of times what happens is, like you said, that people will see uh, things flash on the news media screen. Uh, and sometimes it's sensationalized. Sometimes the information is slant slanted. And we've, we've captured some of that data and where we've brought people in uh, from news groups to community groups to, you know, to, to explain to them uh, why we do certain things. Uh, we, it was, a, it was a, a program called Policing 101. And so we basically brought in local media and said, hey, this is why, this is what use of force is. This is what our policy is. Uh, we also said, hey, does anybody know why we use uh, police canines? Uh, so we brought a group in and we, we explained why canines are, are being used. How about the helicopter? Why do we need a helicopter? What does it do? Uh, what about, what's the anatomy of a traffic stop? What do cops look for uh, during a traffic stop? So these are all like community engagement strategies to help uh, help people understand why we do what we do uh, uh, on daily calls for service. And you didn't ask, but I know that we in our dispatch center, we get between 800 to 1,000 calls for service here in Pasadena. And we probably go to a physical response uh, to about 300 of, uh, incidents. And those are uniform officers in black and white responding to these incidents. So it's, it's, it's ever going, ongoing. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's just the, the activity, it may be shocking to the conscience, uh, uh, you know, of all the activity that's going on in the city. And that's something that, uh, you know, all of the police officers uh, deal with every day and worry about every day. We want to keep our community safe. Nobody wants violence. Nobody wants victims. Uh, and that's what, uh, how we operate. Well, you mentioned that the search for a permanent chief is ongoing uh, and perhaps actually in the very beginning stages. And you personally haven't made a firm commitment uh, whether you want to see the permanent position, but you are the interim police chief. What do you bring to the city now and, and would uh, continue to bring if you become the permanent police chief? You know, I think that, uh, um, you know, the relationships that I built uh, over the years, uh, the institutional knowledge of where we, where we were and where we've come from and how, we, how we're moving forward and why we need uh, 
uh, move forward. We need to have relationships and dialogues with community members. We need to listen to their concerns. And if we need be, we need to change our policies, our practices uh, to, to get better engaged with the community. Uh, we all know that one critical incident can derail and or uh, you know, leave a long lasting uh, negative impact on an organization, uh, but we can survive these uh, uh, these encounters and you know move the department forward to let people know that, hey, the police are human beings. Uh, they, they act just like the rest of us. Uh, we, we, you know, uh, we want to be, you know, humanize who we are and what we do. And one thing when I took the job uh, and, and I wrote an email to my, uh, my whole department and said, one of my main goals is I, I strive to maintain my empathy. And that's, you know, that's what I, you know, will continue uh, saying that, you know, walk in the shoes of others, uh, you know, be in the community where there's uh, like a death just occurred or a huge fight and there's broken glass and there's crime scene tape. You know, these are the things that we uh, need to connect with the community, not forget that I'm the police chief, but something's happening that's affecting lives of others in the community, but also the lives of my officers who may have seen a, a tragic uh, event, may have seen a, a, a deceased baby or somebody that was killed in a car accident. And we all process information differently. And I think it's, it's you know, we need to find a better balance and we've, uh, we've initiated a, a wellness unit to, to deal with officer wellness, but also community wellness too, by connecting the people who are most in need with the resources that can help them. Marcia, as the public information officer, you are very much the public face of the police department. And I know you mentioned that you're pretty early in your term in this position, having begun uh, just in May. But what is your perception of the department's perception in the public eye right now? Yeah. First off, I know that our department has a very good, strong relationship with the media. And I think it's important for me being the selected as the new P PIO to make sure that we keep that relationship. And by doing so is being transparent and making sure as far as that um, any requests that come forth the best as far as to accommodate the needs of the media, knowing that obviously there are deadlines and requirements that, that, that they have. We also want to make sure that information we're putting out is definitely uh, accurate, you know, and, and current. Uh, one thing uh, fortunate that I have is that um, the predecessors before me have two of them that I currently work with, as Chief Clausen, former PIO, as well as one of our um, uh, newly uh, promoted commanders, uh, William Bersafi. So that's a that's definitely a um, an asset for me as far as uh, being in this position. Steve Clawson, are there issues that uh, you see as needing attention either in the city or or within the department? Uh, and is there an agenda for addressing those issues? I think some of the issues are are, are concerns with the community. And uh, several people have voiced their opinions and uh, made tweets on social media. And a lot of times people will make uh, a comment uh, or, or send something out with their emotion and other people will think it's facts or true. And, and, and that's not. So I think that you know, one of the things that I'd like to do is redirect uh, behaviors with words, uh, stay, stay calm in the midst of conflicts, um, you know, deflect verbal abuse, but also you know, offer empathy in the face of antagonism, uh, you know, we need to deal with that. We need to, again, listen to the community. We, and, you know, we, we don't have to, uh, you know, change everything or we don't have to take their recommendations, uh, but we just, we have to listen and we have to, you know, better educate ourselves. And in the areas where we can change things, we will, you know, and I know that's, the, that's a fact because we, we have done it and we are doing it. We now have the Police Oversight Commission and we're, we're talking, we're listening to them, and we're talking with the independent auditor about some things that you know, he would like to see. And uh, we're going to work through those issues, those problems, and, uh, you know, come to a, the best conclusion uh, for not just our officers, but for the community alike. Well, turning our attention back to the, the upswing in crime, particularly in, in L.A. County, you know, a, a relatively local uh, area. Uh, 
we have certainly heard a lot about the L.A. District Attorney, George Gascon, and his uh, lenient policies on criminal activity. Is that affecting your job uh, specifically in a negative way? Is it making uh, police work more difficult? Are we seeing an increase in crime as a result of that? What are your thoughts and your feelings on that? And my thoughts are, my thoughts are he makes business decisions. He is on the, ju the judicial side of the justice system. The police are on the enforcement side of the judicial system. And the role of my officers is to enforce the law. How it's interpreted, interpret, interpreted how what punishment uh, occurs, that has nothing to do with what our outcomes should be. But we need to continue arresting the people that are committing the crimes. And if we put them in jail and they go to jail for a year, that's the decision for the courts. If they get out that night, again, that's the decision uh, to the courts. I know for a fact that we have arrested one guy four times in one day, and this was several years ago. This is before uh, you know any leadership changes. Uh, but again, it's these are challenges that the frontline officers, you know, sometimes they'll sigh and say, "What are we doing out here? Why are we doing this?" You know, they're 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 out there. They're engaging uh, with community members who may be you know, affecting the quality of life uh, by urinating or defecating or vandalizing someone's house. We take the, the perpetrator to jail, they get a citation, uh, and then they get released, and they're out there again doing the crime over and over again. So I can't blame anyone or any system on what the, you know, what's increasing crime other than our officers need to continue to address crime the best they, they can. It doesn't matter if, if one person is taken off the street and charged with uh, you know, a million different things, there's gonna be another issue. And we have to, 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 to be ready to face that person and that issue. Uh, but again, there's other ways we can do things where we don't always have to arrest somebody. We need to do proactive work to prevent these incidents from occurring, such as uh, you know, human beings. I've, I've said jokingly that human beings are lazy. We are, we don't lock our side gate. We don't go to the, the uh, we, we go to the market sometimes. We don't set our alarm panels because we think, oh, it's never going to happen to us. But guess what? That's when it happens where someone's going to break into your house. So I think that if we take a more proactive stance to protect ourselves, our property, our family from people that want to do harm, they want to take something from us. You know, we, again, every day, it's, it's, it's hard being an adult. I had the same conversation with my kid the other day. It's what I, I told her because she's 19. I said, Welcome to the adult world. You're going to have different issues now that you're an adult than you did as a kid. And part of it is personal safety. And your personal safety boils down to personal responsibility. And if you are responsible for yourself, uh, you know, you will take proactive steps to not be a victim, to not be in an area where you shouldn't be, not be, uh, 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 you know, out by yourself at night uh, at a certain time because you know bad things can happen. So I think that if we can take a, a better proactive stance, you know, as a community, getting to know your neighbors. You know, and I tell a story how when I moved into my house, I didn't want to know my neighbors because I think that they would think I was a police officer or no, I was a police officer and knock on my door at all hours of the night trying to help whatever their issues were. But I, about two years after I moved into my neighborhood, I talked to my neighbor and gave my number. And about a year later, he called me one day while I was at work and he said, hey, is he at home? I said, no. He said, you need to get home because you're, uh, basically my water heater broke. Uh, it flooded out my garage. And if it wasn't for him, I think he would have probably called the fire department, but that water would have came into my house. So based on my, my own ignorance, I learned that, you know what? I need to know my neighbor. And then the next day, I basically was talking to my different neighbors, gave my cell phone numbers. And, you know, again, we're at, at the end of the day, we're a community. If some, if I walked out of my house in the morning, I usually take couple seconds, 30 seconds, look at the curb, look around. Hey, is there any cars out of place? Anybody around that shouldn't be here? And if I saw, let's say somebody in an orange vest walking down the side of my neighbor's house, I think I'll pick up the phone and say, hey, are you having work done, cable guy? And oh, no, you're not? Uh, well, somebody's at your house. So maybe it could be a, a burglary crew uh, breaking in. And then then goes to the next step of uh, ring doorbells and security cameras and license plate readers. These are all things that protect us from being victims of crime because i've always said we can sit here and talk all night about crime prevention but there's guys sitting around trying to talk or talking about how they want to victimize us and how they're going to do it 
through fraud, through cryptocurrency, you know, stealing cryptocurrency, breaking into mailboxes. There's all this crime, even on the dark web, that's, uh, uh, that's occurring that we uh, as a society need to get better uh, prepared for and to prevent. Well, certainly I would think that uh, for you and your officers, it has to be somewhat disheartening to know you work so hard to try and keep the public safe and uh, perhaps make an arrest where one is necessary only to have uh, one of those uh, um, suspects turned loose uh, without uh, being duly charged or, or perhaps being charged uh, at, to a much lesser degree. But over and above that, you, you mentioned that you are in enforcement and that is your job. Is it an unrealistic expectation for the average citizen to want to walk around and not have to worry about being hypervigilant about all of the terrible things that could befall them simply walking out their front door? We, we need that. It ha that has to happen. We need to get to that, uh, that utopia, so to speak. Uh, you know, this is uh, bad things happen in this world. And that's why the, you see stuff in the newspaper and the media every day. Uh, that's why there's, you know, we, I think we, we arrest between 5,000 and 6,000 people a year for crimes. And those are the people that we capture. You know, other crimes are being committed that sometimes don't get reported uh, or sometimes we, 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 we never find out or we never able to, to locate the suspect on that. But yeah, I, I would love to do that. Uh, I think that uh, you know it's, that it's possible if we can live in a safer society, and your quality of life goes up, uh, your your own personal wellness goes up. You don't have to look over your shoulder uh, when you're shopping. You don't have to uh, you know think that everyone's going to try to take advantage of you. You know, I think that those are things that you know we need to strive uh, to live with. Uh, but also, how can we address? And again, like I. I, I'm doing this with my daughter now. She's seen things in society that she doesn't like, and she asks questions about it. So I try to tell her, you know, you know, the realities behind uh, when when you're growing up, things you may face with, the decisions, life decisions that uh, you're going to be, uh, you know, you have to make instantaneously uh, about getting in a car maybe with somebody who's been drinking or, or going to the ATM at three in the morning. These are things that you can avoid. Uh, so you know, possibly making better decisions. Uh, will 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 breed better outcomes and you know better quality of life and neighborhood liv livability. Well, as I mentioned earlier, of course, it's been in the news. Unfortunately, all too frequently, it seems that there have been mass shootings all around the country. Um, to bring it closer to home, does the Pasadena Police Department uh, drill have a plan for a, a, such a circumstance within the city? You know, certainly, we all hope that that never comes to pass, but but does the Pasadena Police Department practice for that scenario? Absolutely. We have had we have had suffered a tragedy, a mass shooting event up on Summit Avenue and Penn Street uh, about a decade ago, uh, where I believe three people were killed uh, by one gunman. Uh, and it's something that we worry about, uh, something we train to and train for. Uh, God forbid we ever have to deploy those circumstances. We do have frontline patrol officers uh, in the black and whites. Uh, that go and uh, make an assessment on whatever the critical incident is. Uh, certain things we do on these critical incidents. Uh, we set a containment. We then isolate the suspect, we evacuate, and we have an emergency response team ready. Those are like four entities of, uh, you know, defending or, or, or coming to the aid during a critical incident. But we also have developed that, uh, you know, just not patrol officers or any other police officers may, that, who may be on duty, we then have a different phase that we would go to uh, uh, where we would have to maybe deploy our SWAT team or a, a crisis negotiation team. So these are specialized units that do train uh, for incidents, uh, a shooting at a school. You have uh, you may have a active shooter that may transition to a hostage rescue that you may transition to a barricaded suspect. And these are all th different things that uh, we have dedicated supervisors, but we also have dedicated team leaders to, to work through these problems as they're always rapidly unfolding. And I can't second guess what other agencies did or are going to do or what they wanted to do, but I can just, you know, Key, uh, key, key in on the training that I've been through myself with the SWAT team as a uh, as an, uh, a member that you know these are the things that we want 
to make sure that we don't make mistakes. And a lot of times when we have, we do drills or just a common search warrant, when we are done, we have a critical incident debrief and we call it like a rank off debrief, meaning take your bars and your stars and all your, your stuff off at the door. And if you screwed up, that team is going to tell you. And it's not to, to say, hey, you know, shame on you. It's for us to get better. And this is something that uh, John Perez, uh, my predecessor, uh, initiated uh, where he had what was called the dirt, a 30 day review. And it's basically taken from a hospital setting when, when, when a patient dies, you know, within a certain period of time, that hospital will debrief what happened because that incident's gonna occur again. So we do the same thing where if we have any use of force, we will have a 30 day review where everybody who was on the scene of a, a use of force will come into a room, they'll watch the body worn cameras, on a 200 inch screen television and the instructor who's probably the, the, the use of force instructor or member of our uh, tactical team, uh, uh, training team that they'll go in and say, hey, is this really the best practice? Did we have to do this? What about uh, option, uh, instead of going hands-on, we could have uh, ordered the guy out with a taser. Uh, you, you're a supervisor. Why didn't you you know, say these three guys, you guys are the arrest team, put your guns away. You two guys, you guys have uh, pepper spray and a less lethal device. You two guys, you guys you know, have your guns out just in case something happens. So these are things that we do, again, to be better at tonight because that same incident is going to happen tonight and we did have an incident where an officer was using putting on his rubber gloves one time and a, a subject turned around he had a knife in his hand but not out but you know the question came to everybody's mind have we the police ever trained with using or shooting our guns with rubber gloves on and how does it feel and is there a different hold and you stay you know so the very next day the chief at the time uh we had guys up at the range and we were practicing this we are trying to, to, to navigate this. So we have these 30 day reviews and uh, we've gone through a, like a use of force continuum. It's our critical performance unit that we have a sergeant that's in charge of it. Uh, they, he conducts the 30 day reviews. We also have gone to a more of a judo based uh, training component uh, where we wanted to eliminate our punches and kicks uh, when we're we're confronted with a subject who's violent. Uh, so judo uh, is, you know, basically, uh, excuse me, it's a ju it's a jujitsu, not judo. Uh, we, we're in a studio. And, you know, I think jujitsu stands for gentle art. And it's more of a control situation versus, you know, punches and strikes and kicks. Uh, so we want to be able to grab somebody and like pin them down and hold them down and not use force on them uh, while we take them into custody and or get more units involved to put somebody in handcuffs who may be violent uh, under the influence of drugs or alcohol or, or just doesn't want to go in the program. And the last thing is that we've also done is uh, we have uh, uh, digital platforms where we're having officers review body worn camera footage and you know you have to pay attention because the video might stop and say, what street are you on? Uh, where's your best cover and concealment? How many suspects were, uh, were broadcast in, in what you just heard like two minutes earlier? So it, it really gets to people's critical decision-making. And that's what we're trying to, uh, uh, trying to achieve. Uh, right now, we are, our, our uses of force are very low. And it's, I think it's, it's based upon all of the, uh, the things we have implemented uh, to, again, uh, have officers you know, think on their feet, think of options, think of waiting versus just going in and, and putting hands on somebody. Uh, so at the end of the day, we want a cooperation. And if everybody cooperated with us, we would never use force on anyone. Well, a moment ago in your response, you mentioned the use of the body-worn cameras. Uh, those were only recently approved last year. So how has the deployment or, or the rollout of those body cams gone? And, and how effective is the program? Uh, well, we've actually implemented them in uh, 2018. Uh, so uh, people have been accustomed to utilizing them. Uh, when we're During any incidents, the officers would turn their cameras on. And then uh, recently, we've gone to a new platform where it's a camera. So if I get out of my car, uh, I have to physically take my hand and push the button on the... Uh, uh, on the camera to turn it on. And so what the new system is higher grade, higher resolution, and it allows us, uh, if somebody uh, 
pulls out a gun and fires a gun, all the cameras around that sound of gunfire uh, will turn on. And it's the same thing that happens with our, uh, uh, our tasers as well, that if somebody pulls out their taser and activates their taser, uh, they're going to, there's going to be a, a, all the cameras in the area are going to turn on. Uh, and we, 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 we found this out the hard way where officers that were in the locker room uh, where you're getting ready for your shift, what you do is you turn your taser on and you do a test to make sure your battery is, uh, is operational, your battery is, uh, you know, doesn't need to be recharged, that, you know, officers would take out their cartridges and then activate their tasers and one floor below, body-worn cameras were turning on. So we know that the technology works. Right now we have a, a 90 day uh, trial called Signal Sidearm that's a fa uh, uh, attached to some officers in the field who if there is a sound of gunfire, their cameras will automatically turn on. And our cameras, they buffer back 30 seconds. So if I'm sitting here and I either decide to turn my camera on or a, a sound of gunfire or a taser goes off, the camera will go back 30 seconds in time and turn on and would have captured the actual incident of gunfire. Uh, so that that's uh, um, occurring right now. And, uh, you know, we'll, soon we'll be doing an evaluation. Uh, God forbid we don't have any uh, activations of the this uh, uh, equipment that we're testing and evaluating. Uh, and when that doesn't happen, that means there was no gunfire uh, by the police. So that's what we're looking forward to. So overall, you say that the program is definitely successful, though, and, and something that will remain in use. Correct. And we've seen the camera, the, the, val the value of the camera, where somebody would make a, a, a claim uh, and then it never happened. And we'd bring them in and say, hey, uh, you're, you're, you're stating this occurred, but here's the video. And they say, well, I want to recant my statement or, yeah, you're right, I lied. And, and that's happened before. So it protects the officers as well, but also shows what the officers do and what they're faced with every day and, uh, you know, their engagement with the, with the public. I'd like to ask a little bit about interactions with the recently created Police Oversight Commission. How has that been working? Uh, right now, the representative is, uh, it was Cheryl Moody when it first came on board as she was the deputy chief. Uh, and then when she became the chief, uh, Commander Mark Goodman, who is now the acting deputy chief, uh, is the liaison with the uh, the CPOC is what we call it. Uh, and so we've been attending the meetings. Uh, we've been giving them information that they need. Uh, we now have an independent auditor and we're giving, uh, we're giving him information. I believe right now he wants to look at uh, the past year's uh, use of the force and complaints. So we're gonna provide him the information that he needs and he'll be able to report back out to, uh, uh, I believe the city attorney's office and the commission themselves. How about the HOPE team? Could you give us a little bit more insight as to what the HOPE team is and how that project is progressing? Sure. Uh, the HOPE team is the Homeless Outreach and Psychological Evaluation Team. It partners a uniform sworn police officer with a uh, either a licensed clinical social worker or a nurse or a uh, uh, there was one other classification, uh, an employee from the Department of Mental Health, that they would ride around together as partners in police cars, handling situations of people dealing with homeless issues or mental health crisis, uh, where we would go to these calls for service and not just go there to arrest somebody, but we want to do case management, we want to, to be able to navigate them away from whatever issues the, uh, they're, they're going through. I know that sometimes it's tough. A lot of people have barriers out on a, in society. And there was one guy that we know we've been working on him. And we, it, we, we talked to him over 20 times trying to get him help and get him into housing. And he actually took us up on an offer where we, the, the officer and the, 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 the nurse he was with got the guy a haircut. And ever since this haircut developed, it developed a relationship. So now he's in housing. The good thing is that we also have uh, a support team, which is the, the Pasadena Outreach Response Team, where it's a firefighter who is riding around with a case manager and a social worker, and I believe a housing navigator as well, that's working with both the HOPE team and the PORT team, that they're addressing calls for service 
uh, in our community. We did a beta test where we had a HOPE officer in our dispatch center listening to calls for service. And when the calls for service came in that we knew uh, the, that we could send this unarmed response team, we sent them. And just in our little beta testing, we knew that we can divert uh, like at least one call an hour uh, to this team. And one call an hour may not seem like a lot, but at the end of the year, that's 8,500 calls of, of calls where guns aren't needed. So cops aren't needed to go into these, uh, these situations. And I've heard somebody, you know, criticizing, uh, you know, some of the responses where some cities, let's say, uh, for instance, have a 9% violent crime rate. The, the, the talking point is, well, how about 91% of nonviolent crimes? Why don't we send social workers to those to those calls for service? But they look at the end data. You have to look at these calls for service. You have to look at the beginning data. The beginning data is going to show you that 60% of the calls came in with some type of aggression, some type of violence, somebody's armed with a weapon, some threats were being made. And in no way would I ever send any uh, social worker, EMT, nurse, or housing navigator to deal with a situation where they don't need to be there. So I think that, you know, as we utilize our better practices, uh, we can figure out, again, being students of, of our profession, how we can send the right resources to the people no, most in need. Well, turning our attention to more local news, uh, some of the local papers were reporting that uh, as recently as last evening's city council meeting, there had been approval for the police department to acquire some newer uh, tools, new hardware. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that for our viewers at home? New hardware like military equipment is what you're talking about? There, there has, the, the papers were nonspecific, so I was hoping you could give oh. us a little bit. Uh, one, one of the talking points is uh, uh, military equipment, uh, a bill passed that says that if we're using military grade uh, equipment in our day-to-day -day deployments, we have to get them approved by city council. And uh, there's a lot of less lethal devices that we would, would utilize as last, uh, uh, as last resort, along with some lethal devices. And I know that one of the things that was in contention was a 50 caliber uh, rifle. Um, you know, and I always say that, uh, like for me, I've carried a tourniquet with me for 30 years, over 30. I had it, it's from the military actually. And so I carry this tourniquet when I'm on patrol uh, in a little pouch. And it's, it's, if I go down or if I need it, I'm going to use it and I'm trained for it. But guess what? I haven't used it in 30 years, but I still have it just in case I need it. And I think that that's why we do a lot of stuff with the equipment that we have. We train to it. We, we, we keep it operational. We know how to use it. We have policies and we have procedures on how it's done and why or, or how it's uh, deployed. Uh, but some of this equipment, uh, you know, we, we, we showed think, pictures of, of, of all the stuff we have and, you know, we, we could use it uh, during operational needs to, uh, to, to stop something from occurring, uh, to, to, to utilize it uh, to, to stop a threat. Uh, one of the only things that we have that is truly military equipment are uh, police helicopter, or excuse me, helicopters from the military that we got uh, a long time ago. Uh, so the newer stuff is just, you know, common items used by uh, tactical teams uh, in, in, in uh, police departments, such as pepper balls and uh, uh, less lethal gas. Uh, or stuff to, to render uh, somebody to cooperate, like maybe barricaded inside of a house. And again, you know, I can't honestly tell you the last time we actually deployed deployed any uh, tear gas into a house that because that information that is on that list too. I think it was probably I want to say at least five years ago where somebody was armed with a handgun wouldn't come out and we uh, put some tear gas in his house and he surrendered immediately. So it worked. But again, we never want to use it but we're trained to use it and we have it to use it in case of need. Well, certainly there are those who have argued that in the face of this escalating violence, uh, certainly we hear about the use of, of semi-automatic and automatic rifles in some of these mass shootings. It, it has been suggested that police departments around the country are really outgunned these days, that they're not well enough armed 
in the face of this escalating violence. Uh, certainly coming from a military background yourself, I, I wonder how you feel about that. You know, and it, it's true. Uh, there's people that have uh, weapons that shouldn't have them. People who are suffering mental health crisis, uh, some people that have an agenda, that have an access to a weapon. And a lot of times you know, people will have these guns and they won't get them through uh, normal means, meaning purchasing them through stores. Uh, they have ghost guns now that can I can make in my garage. All you gotta do is buy a 80%, let's call the 80% lower. It's a piece of plastic that comes with a toolkit where I can drill a couple holes and uh, I can convert that gun to an operational weapon. And uh, it's easy for anyone to get the, their hand on, either a handgun or a rifle, or they'll go out of state, go to a different state, go buy ammunition in a different state. So, you know, gun laws, universal gun laws uh, need to be cleaned up. Uh, but there are so many battles on both sides of the fence uh, of the Second Amendment, uh, Amendment that that's for the, the politicians to decide on. And I think that, uh, you know, it's just, it's unfortunate that we, I think year to date, we've uh, recovered, uh, I believe, close to like 93 guns. Uh, so far from our community, and we're averaging about a 15% ghost gun recovery, meaning 15% of those guns are uh, have fallen into the hands of people that shouldn't have guns or that they weren't registered to them uh, through through normal means. Are there things that the community can do to help the police department here in Pasadena? You know, one one of the things that I've I've seen it and talked to people is if you see something. Uh, going on, you see something wrong, call us. People will say, oh, I always thought someone else would call. Well, no, no, those other people think that you would have called. So if, if you see something out of place, call call us, let us know. Uh, even if it's not something that, you know, uh, where immediate, it's an, there's an immediate threat to send the police, information can be shared uh, within the department, within the city departments as well. Uh, we do have an application uh, on our city website where you can you can connect it to your phone where you can report certain things such as uh, a tree branch broken, uh, a, a, a light out. Uh, again, these are all like broken window theories where if you let things fester, more and more stuff is going to fester and then bad elements are going to come out. Uh, so if we report these, uh, again, going back to neighborhood livability, we want people to live in the safest neighborhood with the best lighting, with the, with the less tree cover uh, that can you know, block your way or block your path. Uh, design the environment to prevent crime from occurring. Uh, and I, so I think that those are two ways, by calling us and reporting things to the city uh, uh, application on your phone, uh, especially something like there's, uh, and I've seen it, I just saw it today, uh, there's some toilets that are dumped on the side of a parkway that some somebody think that was, it was okay to do, but they just left it for the city to, to, to clean up. Then the next thing you knew, somebody's going to come there and pile a bunch of old pallets or a desk or something uh, and it, again, it goes back to neighborhood livability and who wants to live in that environment? I don't think anybody does. So please reach out to us, even if it's for advice sometimes. Well, right. And then I think with that, I'm afraid we've pretty much run out of time, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank Lieutenant Marcia Tagloretti and of course, Interim Police Chief Jason Clausen for joining us this evening. Thank you both for your time and your insights. It's been a, a wonderful conversation and we certainly do appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate being here. For our viewers at home, if there are topics you would like to see addressed on this program, you can email them to arroyolive at pasadenamedia.org, and we may include them in a future broadcast. Until next time, this has been Arroyo Live. I'm Joe Carbonetta. Thank you for watching, and good night.